uh, we spend a, I spend a lot of time in the garden uh, yeah. throughout the year. Istanbul has a nice climate, so yeah. you can imagine every season you have something else to do in the garden. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three, so we're doing face-to-face -face live interviews, and we're coming to you from Berlin where it's the International Meeting of Rhinoplasty Societies, and I'm managing to actually get hold of guys who are difficult to get hold of to sit down and chat to. And one of these guys is a legend from Istanbul. Finally, so Nuri <laughs> Cele, thank you so much for you. taking time to chat to us. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. So, so Nuri, the, we've got listeners from all around the world. This goes to like 100 countries around the world. Listen to this podcast. Okay. Tell them, who are you? Well, I... I'm I'm just a, another plastic surgeon from Turkey. <laughs> I think it's just the you know re the advances of the recent year in yeah. plastic surgery in Turkey has just made us distinct among the other colleagues in the world. Nothing nothing specific from that. I'm a little bit older generation. Yeah, probably one of the oldest in uh, in in the in today's group who are already active in practice. Yes. And what made us different from the other guys was that uh, the previous, I think we were a generation that were not satisfied with the education in our own country. And so we, uh, yeah, we started yeah. looking for options yes. in the uh, other countries. In uh, Most of the time, United States. Yeah. Some of my friends went to Taiwan for microsurgery. Yeah, yeah. But United States offered a variety of courses yes. and fellowships. So. Uh, I was one of them, and after I finished medical school, I started my training in plastic surgery. Yeah, and uh, after a while, I was kind of disappointed because I I was an avid reader, and what I read in the books did not match the practice. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I thought there would be something of better quality somewhere else. Wow. Uh, so by that time, I have finished my uh, my exams for United States. So yeah, uh, I had ECFMG certificate, and then uh, that kind of initiated my um, applications for United States fellowships. Okay. And I was lucky to have met uh, Dr. Caraway, who came to give some a series of lectures in Istanbul, and I was yeah. asked to chaperone him during his stay. And then we got in, uh, you know, we had a good uh, friendship. And then yeah. he asked me, afterwards he asked me a thank you letter and wanted me to, uh, to kind of uh, send him if... I had any requests. And so I said, I might be looking for a fellowship in the States because I was already in the middle of my residency yes, at that yes. time. So that was good luck. I, I, I would say so. Yeah, definitely. And uh, then uh, he looked around and I, and then he wrote me a letter saying that, asking me whether I would be willing to get uh, to his fellowship program. Wow. And I said, wow, at that time, I don't know if you realize the Norfolk was uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School uh, plastic surgery program was uh, the top in the country in the United States. No, and uh, yeah, so so I was very pleased yeah. uh, to accept his offer. Things kind of changed a little bit uh, by the time I finished my residence because they lost their fellow uh, their residency program. Uh, okay. The accreditation committee okay. did not approve them any longer, but still it was a good um, experience for me because yeah. I spent time, he was he was an excellent surgeon. Uh, the, I, especially I wanted to learn a lot about the eyelids because unfortunately at that time uh, in, in Istanbul, there weren't many surgeons who were doing, I mean, in-depth uh, analysis yes. of periorbital surgery. Yes. So uh, I, I got to spend a time with Dr. Carraway and I just loved it because I learned so much from him and his practice. Yeah. And also uh, my interest in facelifts started with his uh, with the time I spent there. Amazing. And um and then I was able to kind of rotate around to see other people operate. Okay. I think I visited around uh, during my. I stayed in the United States for four years. Uh, four years uh, of yes. fellowships. Yes. Wow. And I, I think I saw more than one hundred fifty uh, plastic surgeons operate. That's and, incredible. Uh, yeah. And well, were you married at the time or not? I was married at yeah. the time. Yes. Yes. So the, was your wife a, with you overseas? Yes, she was time. with me. Okay. Yes. Yes, she was. Uh, well, she was. What we did was changing places from one place to another and she would kind of try to 
uh, have another a, a year in one school, a year in another. Wow. <laughs> just kind of, kind of. You know, she wanted, she liked that. And then we had kids. Yeah. Uh, and we had two kids while in, we were in the there States, in the state. Yes, oh. while we were there, so she started uh, being uh, busy with them. Uh, so she stopped going to school. Yeah, yeah. and just I, she she made a lot of sacrifices for me. Yeah. You know, just okay. I I think I owe a lot of my uh, position today just to my wife because you know I always had this uh, yeah. warm home to yeah. come back to yeah. uh, after working so for so long hours. Those years. Yeah. We did. Uh, there wasn't any restriction on the hours that a resident or fellow c would work, so yeah. I spent most of my time at the hospital. Yes. Just came back home sometimes just to shower and change clothes, and then go back again. Wow, yeah. uh, wasn't uh, easy, but you just imagine I would never be able to get that amount of practice if I have stayed back in my country because that allowed me to see a, a very wide range of patients. In all, all of them were because I was at the university hospitals. They were all referral, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of more complicated cases, yeah. all that stuff. So, I truly enjoyed it. And then, a friend of mine was in uh, Houston and uh, offered me, um, kind of, he was working with plastic. He was an orthopedic surgeon yeah. and working with the plastic guys for trauma. So. Probably uh, he they were talking and then he said there is an opening in the microsurgery fellowship at Baylor, so I went there. No way. Yes, yes, I did. I did brachioplexus surgery and facial nerve. No way. Uh, for two years, but during this whole time, my major aim was to do something about the face, the craniofacial yes. and as such. So I started applying for fellowships. Okay. So I got a fellowship uh, for craniofacial at the end of those two, three years. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, this was a time, you know, you would just always think, oh, shall we go back? Shall we stay? And yeah. then I said, okay, we're going to stay for one more year and then we're definitely going back. Okay. So I did my, finished my craniofacial fellowship. And I'm grateful to everyone that I worked with because, you know, kind of expanded my knowledge about plastic surgery. I think I went far beyond what I intended to do because I wanted to get some experience with. But you should understand, I was a voracious young uh, plastic surgeon, you know, right. just wanted to learn everything. Yes, it yes. just so. And unfortunately, those times, my country did not offer any fellowships, yes. you know, any any postgraduate training. So that was the only way. And I think that uh, kind of satisfied my voracious appetite f for learning so that I could go back home. Yeah. And people around me started saying, when are you going to go back home? Please yes, go yes, and yes, start yes. working. Okay. But it's just, it was fun. I went back home. My whole idea was to become a, uh, associated with a university hospital. Okay. But my time spent in the States taught me that I could do the same things being in private yes, practice yes. and okay. make money, you know, yeah. just support a living for the family. Okay. So I went back to Istanbul and I said, okay, I'll just start my private practice. That's how it started. It's amazing. Yeah, my face, the face was always my uh, kind of starting yeah. point for everything. Uh, I like challenges and I think that was the most challenging thing in plastic surgery, yeah. of course. So I started doing reconstruction aesthetics, uh, and then because of the time I spent in the States, people started referring patients to me. So my first patients were mostly uh, complication patients for rhinoplasty and then uh, facial surgeries, periorbital surgeries. Mm -hmm. So a lot of reconstructive, uh, I, I should say, uh, revision surgeries. Um, and still revision is kind of 70% 70, 70 of my practice. And most of the uh, aesthetic cases are uh, referred to me uh, uh, to be seen by me, and I do a lot of revision still. Yeah. Still, rhinoplasty is a complete different business. When I first started doing rhinoplasty, rhinoplasty was my utmost importance. Um, but now it's getting less because of there are so many people who are willing to do rhinoplasty, yeah. and the prices, you know, you, you know the it's market wrong. rules, the prices yeah. change. And uh, there are so many people offering, you know, I, I'm kind of a very, uh, you know, I try to stand on my feet and uh, people uh, offer the patients kind of 
clouds, the clouds, and then yeah, people yeah, go yeah. for them. Yeah, uh, I think it's exactly. just I, I, I never intend to do that. It's just reality is very important in uh, whatever you can get. Uh, I think it's very important in plastic surgery yeah. and aesthetic surgery yeah. also. The yeah, most absolutely. Yeah. I guess so. Uh, that is that is the main thing. It's just uh, rhinoplasty is now um, probably becoming less. Okay. I don't know how it's gonna stay. All the rhinoplast patients that I get today are from my uh, older patients uh, okay. and the patients that I, I operate on. Yeah. I don't advertise because advertising is not permitted in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, you have to sign a contract with the government and wow. uh, because I don't want to be associated with the government, I didn't sign that contract, so I'm not allowed to advertise. Really? If you sign the contract, you can. Because that's interesting because there's a lot of crazy advertising oh, yes, that you yes, can see. Yes, yes, but they sign that's a contract so kind of a, with the government and you have to have uh, apply some rules to your yeah. practice. Yeah. Uh, I don't like to be governed by anyone yes. in my private practice, yep. especially the government. Uh, so that's the, one of the reasons I did not sign any contact with them. Yep. Uh, that's why they are checking on me regularly that I'm not advertising. Uh, wow, and, how's that? Eh? <laughs> well, it's just, of course, it, that puts you a little bit back in the market. But I but, cannot complain I mean, about it yeah. because I have uh, more than 25 years of practice now. Miri, it's so interesting. It's so inspiring. I look at your story and I think back to like, I also, I didn't have four years of fellowship, but the States Excellent. and traveling was what started because yeah. I thought there wasn't anything in South Africa. And now finally, yes. a few months ago, we've been approved for me to run the first ever facial plastic surgery fellowship in South Africa with Excellent. another friend of mine called Marshall Murdoch. So, oh, I mean, Excellent. imagine where it's going to be in years to come. It's, it's oh, really oh. great to hear that. So what I wanted to ask you then is how did you, by going into private practice when you came back from the States, how did that translate into teaching more in the, the, the Turkish uh, like society or community? Because there were guys like Fazl who was probably around about then as well, doing something. Yes, of course. of course. But Fazl is like, ENT. Yeah, he's ENT yeah. trained. But, he, but I think... We were Turkey separate. Is, we were separate. Initially, but at the classic. moment, my understanding yes. is there's yes. a good relationship yes. between plastics yes. and ENT. Yes. But how did it get to the point where 25 or 30 years ago, when you went to the States, there was some training, to now there is training? Or hasn't it really gotten there yet? Oh, the training uh, now. I don't think uh, you, people would like to go back to abroad uh, for any kind of plastic really? surgery training in Turkey because you can just uh, go around the private hospitals, visit people, and you would, in my opinion, you would get quite a good pra yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. training uh, watching people there yeah. because, the, especially the young generation, you know, people are so willing to teach. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of good intention uh, in uh, related to plastic surgery in Turkey still. And I think in the underdeveloped countries, there's a lot of good intention still. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and everybody knows that the uh, university hospitals may not offer the best of uh, practice in regards to aesthetic surgery yeah. because of the lack of patients and all that stuff. Yeah. So people are always willing to accept you to the operating room. And if you're especially Turkish, you don't have any problems w with the hands-on experience. Yes. So that's easy. Of course, if even if you're a foreigner, I had two fellows in the past that was sent by ICEPs and uh, we did not have any problems with them uh, having hands-on uh, kind of practice. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Mm. Uh, the underdeveloped countries are different in uh, regards to registration. You know, yeah. you, you can imagine, and the developed countries have all always that kind of problem, whether you will be allowed to operate in the uh, exactly. surgical rooms or not. But mm -hmm. uh, in our country, it's not completely established yet. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Turkey is in a whirlwind of, uh, change, uh, mm -hmm. of changing politics mm -hmm. in regards to every every section mm -hmm. of uh, you know science these days. So yeah. we're not really standing at on any standardization point right now. Yeah. But uh, who yeah. knows what's going to happen in the future? Yeah. But um, for the present time, uh, things are a little bit you know kind of relaxed. I should yeah. say, yeah. So. Things are easy for the new beginners and also very difficult because it's difficult to start a private practice because of the, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, competitiveness, uh, competitiveness yes. and the high number of yeah. uh, people. Yeah. And unfortunately, there has been an, a very, uh, very unrelated increase uh, by the government related issues 
the increase in uh, the a plethora of uh, residency, plastic surgery residency programs that is not controlled. Really? Yeah. So a very high yeah. number of graduates uh, and uh, what they are, I don't think this is coincidental, they are trying to uh, start an inflation of plastic surgery so that the price will go down. I hear what you're saying. That's yeah. interesting. Eh? Yeah. That's what I think. That's what yeah. I think. Because but you know, you pay peanuts and you get monkeys. Oh, well, that's another is issue. I don't think the governments are, uh, especially the World Health Organization, is, uh, has any uh, th thought about that. The no. World Health Organization, Turkish government is working with them uh, to reduce the prices of medical care. Uh, you know, I don't know yeah. if you're aware of this, but World Health WHO is, in the past 15 years, is working constantly on reducing the prices of the medical care. Yes. And Turkish government has been a good follower in that aspect, really? and they even gave a prize to Turkish government for that regards. And Turkish, uh, what the Turkish government and did these was are the same guys who did such a great job at COVID, hey? Oh yes, and yeah. they reduced the salaries of uh, Turkish doctors uh, to start with, and now they are trying to restrict the number of private practitioners per city. <sighs> and crazy. the next step. Uh, might be uh, even closing the private practices. Uh, so, but the guys who are making those rules, where do they go for their medical care? Do well, they go to private, <laughs> or do they go to their own facilities? That's, that's you know. Yeah. Let's just just think about it. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, government related uh, issues are always a problem, yeah. and I don't still understand in the twenty first century why government why a government would still insist on grasping everything under control because it, yeah. it's not going to be able to manage it. Look at yeah. England. Everything is in medicine. Everything is bankruptcy. Yes. You know, yes. but that's what's going to happen in Turkey. We are already have a bankrupted economy. Yeah. And just think of what happens if the health issue. But there are also some other issues. Last year, the greatest income, uh, the greatest uh, foreign income for Turkish government, first was tourism. And the second was medical tourism. No way. So the government wants to grab wants to grab the medical tourism in its own hands yeah. to make money for himself. Absolutely, sure. Okay, Yuri, let's I mean, Yuri, let's sort of chat about um, something else now because uh, I'm also getting flustered about these politicians. <laughs> tell <laughs> tell us about your actual practice. What do, what do you do uh, mostly? My actual practice. Yes. Well. I'm I'm kind of a laid back guy, uh, especially after COVID. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm working less hours right now. Okay, which is good. Yeah, sure. That's why yes. you look so healthy. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I try to. I I love plastic surgery. Yeah. I love aesthetic surgery, yes. and I wanna have fun with my work. Yes, uh, that's my motto. It has always been my motto, even when I started my fellowships. Because I said, if I know everything, if I learn everything, working. And doing surgery will be just fun for me because I won't be stressed about yes. it. Because I had so many professors stressed when they were doing surgery, I said, I'm not going to be like that. Yes. So yes. I, I like, I enjoy myself when I do surgery. I cannot advertise. So I get referrals. My practice is not as fast, as crowded as the other guys, most of yeah. the other guys, but uh, I get a lot of referrals for complications. I try to. Uh, you know, in the office, it's a laid back office. I have office surgeries. Uh, I don't have the American type of practice. It's more like a Zen type of practice, very quiet, calm, beautiful, and man. slow. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. like we, in, in South Africa, the hospital we build, Age Day Hospital, it's, at, it's like built on the side of a cliff. Oh, okay. And it's just open space, wood, glass everywhere. It's just really, like, yeah. Calm down because work is a place to just. Of course. Don't you think it. so? I love yeah. it. I love I love going there because it's just like, it's not a stress. It is, you, obviously, surgery is stressful. Yes, definitely. But let's try and make it as least stressful as we can. Definitely. Enjoy yourself. Yeah. While you, I, my office is in a historic building. Great. I have, yes, I have high ceilings and oh, a high, big volume. And, and I, ch I chose the colors, very simple colors. And so the patients always say they feel relaxed when they come in. And I don't give appointments that are very close to each other. The office never gets crowded. M uh, some of my patients don't want to be seen by others. Yes. So uh, I try to keep people uh, yeah, separate great, from eh? uh, each other. It's so, quality, so. eh? 
Tell yeah, me, what I do you do then with your extra time? My extra time. Well, my wife is a modern art curator. Uh, okay. Both of us are very much interested in art. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm more like I'm more classical than who. Okay. And um, now our kids are gone. We are just by ourselves. What I do is I work in the garden. Yes. Uh, I like gardening. I yes. love gardening. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we spend. I spend a lot of time in the garden uh, yeah. throughout the year. Istanbul has a nice climate, so yeah. you can imagine every season you have something else to do in the uh, garden. I was there last year in about Which April, one? May. April, May. And the flowers, the time. tulips, I, just, I think. It was astounding. Just, eh? Yeah, it's sometimes, in some seasons, you know, April, May and uh, June. Yeah. I think fascinating yeah. uh, because uh, the city is full of uh, smells of the yeah. some of the trees, some of yeah. the flowers. Uh, it's a good time. Yeah. It's a good time. And uh, I enjoy being there. Yeah. I always loved Istanbul. I always wanted to live there. And, um, you know, we have a small garden. But, uh, you know, every year I make things up uh, from the scratch again. It's just uh, different colors, different flowers. Mm -hmm. I try different things. And, and you were telling me a beautiful story earlier when we were chatting about uh, your visit to South Africa a few years ago with your oh, son. Yes, definitely, definitely. It was the experience of uh, of our lives, probably especially for my son. Yeah. Well, he always wanted to go to uh, South Africa, to safari. Yes. When he was growing up. And it's just, he was like nine years old. I said, first of all, it's dangerous. <laughs> Second, you're not going to remember anything, okay. you know, when you grow up. So I said... I prom he made me promise that I would take him for a safari when he was 18. Okay. Okay. So quite by luck, I got invited by the South African Society for a meeting, for yeah. giving talks on a meeting. And he was 18 years old at that year. So we took time from his school. And uh, we, I first traveled, uh, we first traveled to the meeting. Yeah. And then after the meeting, my wife and my, our daughter had to go back to Turkey because our daughter had uh, some exams. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm glad they didn't come because they are afraid of certain things. Okay. <laughs> so uh, That's a cool father-son thing as well. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that was the first ever, uh, probably after he grew up, that we would be together. Wow. You know, that was, is a, usually a tension time between the father and the son yes. uh, because he's grown up and everything. So he was keeping distance. You know, he's just behaving. He's the man and all until that the stuff. line ruled. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> then he wants no, to until, <laughs> until they gave us those whistles when we first entered the yeah. hotel, the, uh, yeah. the, um, the place. And he asked the guys what the whistle was for. And then they said... You may encounter a wild animal while you're walking to your room. Okay. You know? And then I saw him turn white. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So this was interesting for me because I never thought he would be afraid of animals because when he was a kid, it just was his love, you know, yeah. the animals, the wild, especially the wild animals. So then you just it was so amazing because, you know, every time he wanted to go to the room, he would just say, Let's go to the room, and we would just go together, okay. <laughs> not by himself. <laughs> not by... Oh and wow! We slept in the same room, and then at, at the at the uh, top, the monkeys at night would be just running around, and yeah. it just he got so nervous. Shy man. It's just you know the hippopotami would yeah. just be walking uh, underneath our shower area. Yeah. He got irritated. I just. I realized, you know, I should have sent him much earlier, actually, yeah. because, yeah, yeah. but, and then he got tense and all that stuff. And then, you know, a couple of years earlier, uh, this is like probably eight years after our visit, he suddenly turns to me and says, what lovely days, father, do you remember them? So, you know, with all this amazing. jumbo mumbo, I think he got yeah. a certain amount of delight from the whole that's thing. That's amazing. Yes, that was and I should thank your uh, organization for that because yeah. I think yeah. that was a lovely thing to yeah. do for, our, not for ourselves, but for my son. Yeah. Uh, because if it was not for my son, I wouldn't even go to the safari because, exactly. you know, it my age, get back and, yeah. you know, my age, you know, just uh, I wouldn't, I wasn't so much interested in seeing. My son was also very disappointed about the lions because 
for some reason when we got near the lions they were sleepy oh yeah they sleep so much eh? yeah yeah they and uh, you know i think he expected them to be very active and kind of roar to us <laughs> and all that stuff and the poor guys were just on the on, on the ground laying and sleepy with just one eye open and all that stuff just yeah, if he'd gotten out the vehicle they would have stood up yeah but i i told him you can just try climbing down uh, <laughs> see what happens, to see what happens <laughs> Wow. Nuri, listen, I've, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. It's so interesting it's a, getting a glimpse into the life of somebody who's like, you seem to be very at peace. Eh? So I've got one last question that I want to ask on behalf of the listeners. Is, is there a possibility for them to come and shadow you or watch you operate or get some teaching from you? Or does yeah, definitely, it, always. And, and how do they go about that? I have no objection to it. But do they, is there, do you have a website or your contact details or how oh, would they get hold of you? Uh, they can they can contact me through my email. Okay. That's not a problem. That's okay. not a problem. Yeah, WhatsApp is my office right now, so okay. they can write me through my uh, WhatsApp number. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll put your WhatsApp number okay. Okay. on or when we send out the podcast. Okay. Well. Definitely, Great, definitely, eh? definitely. So on behalf of all the listeners, thanks, man. Thank, thank you, you so much for your time, and it's thank fascinating you. just listening to oh, your life story. Eh? Thank you so much. Thank cool. you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Oh.